lot in Acts chapter 2, all kinds of things you get into, but I'm actually just going to be focused on a, on a small section there at the end. And basically, what I'm be preaching about this morning is just a subject of church planting and how churches get started, how they ought to get started, and, and just kind of the mechanism behind doing that. Now, um, I just want to start off by saying, first of all, that everything that we do as Christians, you know, we, we ought to be done as closely as possible to the Bible. That's probably why you all are going to an independent fundamental Baptist church is because among all the various denominations and groups of people out there, um, it's been my experience that the independent fundamental Baptists seem to be the closest to just trying to do things according to the way that the Bible says and not just based off of every random tradition or not just being very loose with God's word and just kind of applying it however you want and not really caring about some of the things that are said. No, we care about every word of God. And you know what? God cares about every word of God. God cares about the way that we ought to do things. You go back to the Old Testament, we read chapters and chapters and chapters of how the tabernacle is supposed to be built and who is supposed to be in charge of what. And, and I mean, down to every last dimension, the dimensions of the, you know, all of the, the snuffers and the basins, and the bowls and the dishes. And, and, and he has, God gives explicit instructions. On those. So when God tells us very clearly, like, this is how you do something, then that's how you do it. There's no question about it. When he, when he told the children of Israel, you know, when they carry the Ark of the Covenant, they're supposed to carry it on staves and they're supposed to put it on their shoulders and they're supposed to transport it that way. That's the way they were supposed to do it. And when they didn't do it that way and the Ark was going to fall, Uzzah put out his hand and God killed him. When he told him not to offer strange fire, but he gave him all the ingredients for the incense that were supposed to be offering up in the tabernacle and Nadab and Abihu decided to just do something different on their own, guess what? They died. So God is very serious when it comes to his instructions and he tells us how to do things. So we ought to take that very seriously, right? With everything, in every, every aspect of God's word, of God's instructions, we need to be doing that and try to follow as close of a biblical model as we can. However, there are many other things that we do in our daily life or things that we do even in our service to God that is not explicit, that is not so finely detailed as other things are, as the tabernacle building was. So in those instances, we have to rely on other things. We have to rely on biblical principles. We have to rely on examples or models maybe that we have in the Bible. But we also have to be careful not to um, you know, make decisions, say, based on a lack of something. So like the Bible doesn't say something in general, like there, there's people out there, there's some people out there that believe that we shouldn't have any musical instruments in our service to God, right? In our church service. And the reason why they say that is, well, we don't see any New Testament churches playing instruments. Okay, you're, 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 you're using faulty logic because you're just coming up with something just on the lack of something, not on... Not on clear statements. So we have clear statements in the book of Psalms. We see clear statements regarding David and the instruments and the men singers and the women singers. And, and the Bible says to praise the Lord and, and you know, that the Lord's going to be praised on, a, on an instrument of six strings and on all these various instruments, right? That these are all good things. And we don't see anything saying, hey, that's done away with. Hey, you don't do this anymore. So we don't have the clear statement saying that. Now we don't have the clear statement in the New Testament saying you need to do this. But it's already there. It's, it's already been established in the Old Testament. We don't need that. So we don't want to get too carried away with, with some of the examples that we've seen and just, and just coming up with conclusions that's really not based on evidence at all, right? But we need to use these examples and, and use what we see here as, well, this should be our model. And we're going to follow as closely as possible this as we can. And... Um, we're going to be kind of going through the book of Acts as, as sort of like an overview, a, a, a summary, and kind of hitting key points when it just comes to specifically churches that are started. And we're going to see, we're going to glean some information on how that happened because what, what's, what's happened recently, and to be honest with you, I wasn't even sure exactly how I felt about this myself. We get used to certain ways of doing things and certain traditions and certain just this is the way things have been done. And you get taught certain things, but then when something else pops up, it might, you know, it might just 
rub you the wrong way or, or you might start to think that's wrong. And you know what? When it comes to other churches and the way other people do things, we are still independent ultimately. We don't need to get upset when other people do things that maybe you don't agree with or that we don't agree with or, or whatever, right? People are free to do what they want. But recently what we've seen happen, at least within our movement, within people who are very like-minded, who have the same beliefs, is you know, typically what mo the way most of the churches have, have started, which is the way that this church started, was a pastor is, sent, is ordained and sent out before the church even really exists and then goes and builds the church and runs the church and that's how our church started. But the way that other churches are starting is that there is no pastor in an area that's ready to be ordained, but there is a group of believers. There is a congregation. There is technically a church. There are people that want to do that. So there's people that are filling in and, and, and helping to teach and to run and to, and to lead, but they're not the pastor. They still are under an authorityship of another church, of a church that still that has a pastor who is now um, deciding and terming and pastoring that second church. And we're going to get into that a little bit later in the sermon. Basically, I, I kind of want to just bring this up real quick at the beginning because we're going to look and see, based on both of these models, is one of them wrong? Is one of them right? Are they both right? Are they both wrong? You know what? What what's what does the Bible really say on this matter? And let's go to the scripture for our answers. Just because someone does something doesn't make it right. But just because we have never heard it before or seen it before doesn't make it wrong either. And one of the things I just want to remember is, you know, getting really, really, really dogmatic about things that don't have just like very clear statements and, you know, can become a problem. We need, and we need to watch out for that and just be careful that we're not getting overly dogmatic about things that there may not be a lot of information on in scripture and what i found especially when it comes to serving god is that if there's not a lot of just clear instruction we have liberty to serve god in various ways we, we are able to do things and and to to get the things done if we're not contradicting the clear statements of god and not doing things the way you know then there's there's not a problem with it i mean we do things like we print invitation cards that have our church address and the plan of salvation on the back and a phone number. And, you know, the Bible didn't say anywhere to do that. The Bible doesn't say anything at all about that. It says we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. But because the Bible doesn't say that, does that just make it wrong for us to do that? I don't think, is, is it wrong to make a, a documentary DVD that, that has clips from different preaching and Bible verses and everything else? Uh, I mean, of course we don't believe that, otherwise we wouldn't be stocking them in the back. But see, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't say to do that. It doesn't say this is what you're supposed to be doing. But we could take the Bible principles of spreading the truth, buy the truth and sell it not, and, and, and you know all the things that the Bible says about getting this message across, and we're going to use it, and we're going to do it. And you know what? I don't think that God's made it. I don't think it's a sin. If it's a sin, it would say so. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's, let's dig into, though, because we really want to dig in. Let's get our foundation, our principles from the Bible. I mean, that's, we believe the Bible. This is what we all care about. We should have integrity to say, let's see what Scripture says about this. Now, what we do see from Scripture, we started off in Acts chapter 2 because we see a little bit of the growth of, from Acts chapter 1, there's 120 people. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's 120 disciples, including the apostles, men, women, right? They were meeting in the room, and that's basically what the church was. The New Testament church was there's 120 people. In Acts chapter 2, we have the day of Pentecost, and they start preaching the gospel, and they're, you know, they're given this great gift of, of being able to speak with other tongues. And they're preaching the gospel and a whole bunch of people get saved on that one day. 3,000 people alone on that one day get saved and baptized and are added to the church. So we see that here. Just jump down real quick to verse number 41 in Acts chapter 2. We'll just read that. The Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So this is huge growth, right? I mean, going from 120 to 3,000. Just 
in one day. Praise God, right? That's awesome. Huge growth one day, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So they're, they're in it, man. They're, they're, they're not only saved, but, I mean, they're, like, added to the church. I mean, they just became church members. They got saved. They got on fire, and they're just they're showing up. They're listening to the doctrine. They're having fellowship. They're breaking bread. They're praying. You know, they're, they've really plugged in right away. And verse 43 says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together, and all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. So um, this is what we see just right off the bat. This is the beginning. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 6. And before we even get there, I kind of skipped over a page of my notes because what we see from Scripture that's very clear before we even get into the rest of this church establishment is one, we see evangelism, right? Very clear on going out and preaching the gospel of every creature. Very clear, you know, setting people out two by two. Very clear instructions and examples. We see the apostle Paul and other helpers that were with him specifically traveling and preaching the gospel and getting churches established and then moving on. This is what we're going to see as we go through our overview in the book of Acts. of how Because most of the disciples and the apostles stayed at Jerusalem. When Jesus said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature, they stayed in Jerusalem. They stuck there. And he, they even said, oh, we're going to be the apostles to the circumcision, and Paul can be the apostle to the uncircumcision, right, to, those, to the Gentiles. We're going to be the apostles to the Jews. You can go out to the Gentiles. So they all kind of stuck around. So God needed, you know, someone to go out and do this, and that's what the apostle Paul was doing, and that's what we read about in most of the New Testament is that work that's being done. We have the, the epistles of Paul sent to the churches, and we have, um, you know, the book of Acts, primarily focuses around what Paul did. Now, we have what Peter did and James and John. You know, we have other stories in the book of Acts. But still, a lot of it is dedicated to the work that Paul was doing. Paul and Barnabas. So, they're going out. They preach the gospel in various towns. Now, it's not like today where they have this transportation where you can just go from town to town to town real quickly. They go into a town. They have to, to eat and survive. And they stay in these towns for a while. They're preaching the gospel, they're preaching everybody, and then they're building churches. And once a church is established, they move on. They don't just stay there and be planted. Okay, they, just, they, they keep going on because the goal is to get people saved first and foremost, and then to teach and to train them, and then keep moving. That was their plan. That was what we see very clearly laid out in Scripture. And we also see clearly in Scripture that churches that are already established that need elders ordained. We see that in First and Second Timothy and in Titus. Those are called the pastoral epistles. That's where Paul's writing to people who are elders, who Timothy and Titus were both elders, but he's giving them instructions on what to do. And he tells Titus, hey, go and ordain pastors because there's things that are wanting. We'll get to that Scripture a little bit later. But it, there, there was a need. There were churches that were meeting. There were people who were meeting together. And there was no elder. And they needed one. So we see that example in the Bible. Now, again, we're going to get into a, get everything. But I just want to see. We see that clearly from Scripture, that that happened. That, that that is one of the things that happened. That there were churches without a pastor at that location. But they still had someone who was calling shots from a distance. And... and telling them what to do, okay? Um, that, is, that is in Scripture. We also see the qualification. Now, the qualifications is very explicit. For elders and deacons, right, there is a list. And this is what, that's one of those areas where we say, okay, this is a list. This isn't just suggestions. These are commandments. This is instruction. This is, we, we cannot just say, well, you know, it says the husband of one wife, but... That can be the, the, the husband of one, the wife of one husband, or you know, it says they have they, that they have to have children, and you know, so that they can show that they rule their house well. But if they don't have any kids, that's okay, right? And, 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 and no, we can't do that. They're clear instructions. Those are the guidelines. These are not just the guidelines. Those are the rules. Say so if you're going to ordain somebody, 
then this is what you follow. And it's very clear, very explicit. We don't really add to that. We don't take away from that. It is what it is. Say, this is who you ordain. This is how, these are the rules for ordaining a, a pastor. That's clear. That's laid out. But when we see that level of explicitness, can anyone show me the exact method in which a New Testament church must be established that's just laid out and say, this is the way you do it? Because it's not there. So we need to use the examples. We need to use the model. We need to see the way things were done and understand that since there isn't the explicit hardcore instructions, that there is some liberty there. There is allowance to do things based on biblical principles in a way that is not necessarily going to be wrong. Okay? Turn if you go to Acts chapter 6, because we're, we're, we're kind of skipping through some of these some of these chapters were do a real um, higher level overview in the book of Acts. We saw the church go from 120 to 3,000 overnight, and then daily after that, they were being added, but they were still all local to that area. So basically, you've got a really big church, or maybe a couple of churches, but they're all really local. They're all, you know, they're, they're, they're just real. There's just a lot of people in, in kind of one region. Look at verse number one of Acts chapter six. The Bible says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So even up to this point, and you'll have to go read the whole book of Acts when you get home and you can look through this, but um, there's no other mention of like the churches being formed and things like that in between here, we still just see stories that are relevant to local at Jerusalem. Okay, I'm just, I'm just bringing that up. You can verify that for yourself. But um, as we, as we kind of jump through and skip ahead to chapters, I'm highlighting the parts where we can get information on the churches. So what happens here is that the church is responsible for supporting widows that are widows indeed. Widows that have no other family members. Widows who are, who are known of good works and things like that. Now, it's not clear to me that at this point, this early on, because Paul hasn't even written, Paul, at this point, Paul hasn't even gotten saved yet. And he hasn't written those epistles stating to honor those, honor widows that are widows indeed and for the church to take care of those with all of those explicit guidelines of they have to be 60 years old, they have to, you know, um, been hospitable and wash the saints' feet and do all, you know, all of the various things that the Bible is talking about for a widow to be taken care of by the church. So what probably was going on is they were probably a little bit more, um, you could say, giving in their, you know, a little bit more broad or open in their scope of which widows that they would take care of. I, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing that, that those guidelines kind of came a little bit later. So maybe they were helping more people than, than they should, and, and that could be one of the reasons why that was given later, is just to say, hey, you know, there's actually too much of this going on. We need to make sure that the church isn't held responsible for all of these people. Um, in any case, there's a lot of people. That, I mean, 3,120 plus every day people being added to the church. That's still a huge number of people. So what was happening here is some of the Greeks, the people who were, who are new, new Christians, new believers, these, these Greek people, they're saying, hey, what about our widows? Right? We assume the Hebrew women were probably already being taken care of within the church and within their community. But they say, well, we have widows, right? They need to be taken care of, and, and the church is supposed to be helping us and take care of this. So there's this murmur, and they're kind of complaining about it. And as a result, we see here in verse number two, the Bible says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So the apostles are like, you know, the, the twelve are just like, we've got other things to do. I mean, we've got to go out and, and spread the word of God. and you know, We have other things that are more important than just going. Not that it's, it's not important to take care of people. But they said, this is our job. This is our calling. This is what we're supposed to do. So we need help in this matter. And then they choose out seven people. Which, think about that. I mean, how many widows did they have to take care of? They needed seven people to help in the daily tasks of just making sure they're taken care of and fed and clothed and things like that just on a regular basis. So it says in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, 
but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So a church grows. You need people in different job functions, of course, different members of the body. So their function is to go out and to just keep evangelizing and spreading the gospel. Whereas now we have deacons that are being appointed here to do other uh, administrative work within the church because it needs to be done. So that's, that's why they ordained the seven people. So it's a little bit, again, it just gives us a little bit of insight of how the church is working. But this is still at this point, basically one church. One huge church in Jerusalem. Now, turning forward to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. We're going to see Antioch. Antioch's a good example. Now, in this passage in Acts chapter 11, the, uh, the primary purpose of this has more to do with, with the kind of the preaching to the Gentiles than anything else because, again, you know, a lot of the Jews at the time were kind of mixed up on just still keeping things within the Jewish nationality or race, right, and not going out because they, they had their own traditions and customs that they were following that was not from the Bible to just like to not eat with, with Gentiles and things, you know, all these other things where... They had, they had problems with them thinking of themselves a lot higher and having a pride issue just nationally over other people. And God straightens that out through, you know, giving Peter visions and through the Apostle Paul explaining that, no, no, you know, both Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile, they're both, you know, they're all one in Christ and, and that we're sent to go do that and everything else. So we're going to see a little bit of that here in Acts chapter 11, but we can also glean a little bit more information um, about the church at Antioch because the church at Antioch was started by disciples from Jerusalem. And um, I'm not exactly sure who the elder was. The Bible doesn't tell us explicitly who the elder at, was at Antioch or elders because it also was a very big church. It had um, you know, a, lot, a lot of people there. But let's, keep, let's start reading here in verse number 19. Acts chapter 11, 19. We're going to read a little bit about Antioch and the church at Antioch. Because this is after persecution arose. So in Acts chapter 7, we see St the martyr Stephen, right? Stephen, he's, he is one of those deacons that was appointed to do the daily ministration. He's preaching. He gets stoned. See, God had to send some persecution to kind of get them to, to, to move out, to not just stay in one place and build their Tower of Babel. I mean, that's not what they were doing. But, you know, I mean, God, God had to do something to get them to move and, and to, to spread out and to get the gospel out to people. So they do that, and here we are in verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So they're going out, but they're still only targeting Jews. They're not preaching to the Gentiles. They're not preaching to the Greeks. Verse number 20. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. So some people that weren't, that they were already from these other countries, from, they're from Cyprus, they're from Cyrene, they're the ones now that are preaching to the Greeks and they're preaching the gospel of the Greeks. So they, they come along, they're getting these people saved. Verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So now there's a, there's a whole bunch of Greeks that get saved. Verse 22, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So Jerusalem gets news of this, of all these Greeks getting saved and, and becoming part of the church. So Barnabas is sent from Jerusalem to the church at Antioch, verse 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. So, again, we don't have all the details on was there already an elder established in Antioch? We don't know. But one thing we do see, we see, we see preachers, we see prophets coming from Jerusalem and going to Antioch and preaching there. And that wasn't a problem. And we see Barnabas going there and checking up on things. And then we see Barnabas getting, bringing Saul in because at this point he 
He wasn't being referred to as Paul, but he was saved at this point. And uh, we see him, you know, being brought there. And there's prophets, you know, going back and forth. And Paul and Barnabas basically are staying there for a while. They're, they're kind of part of the church and they're, and they're teaching, instructing, and, and um, just being church members there. And then in Acts chapter 13, if you flip to Acts chapter 13, we're going to see where Paul and Barnabas are called out of that church. They're still in that church up to this point in Acts chapter 13. Verse number one, the Bible reads, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work one whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So here we see exactly what's happening. They're at the church. There's various prophets and teachers at Antioch. And God calls them to do another work. He doesn't want them just staying within that church. I mean, the church must be th you know, it's thriving or doing great. They're, they're serving the Lord. They're preaching. They're teaching. They're evangelizing. But they're still there. And God says, no, I need Paul and Barnabas specifically. He says, Saul, Saul and Barnabas, they need to be separated because I have a job for them to do. So they, they hearken to God. They hearken to the Holy Ghost. They fast. They pray about it. And then they lay their hands on them and send them out. They, they ordain them. They send them out. Verse number four. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. Now flip over to chapter 14. Because now we're going to see just the work that they're doing. They were called out. They were sent out to do a specific job. And we, it's not even told us in Acts 13 right there exactly what the job is. He said, look, I've got work for them to do. So send them out. They didn't know what, exactly what the work was they were going to do immediately, but they, you know, the Holy Ghost led them, God led them, and, and they understood what their, what their job was to do. And we read about their job. We're going to see more examples here. Acts chapter 14, we see the pattern of the work they're doing here in Acts chapter 14 Verse number 21. Again, you could read all these in context. There's other things that go on. I'm just kind of hitting the highlights. Verse number 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to, into Italia and thence sailed to Antioch. And from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. So here we see the guys being sent out to preach the gospel. They get people saved. They teach. They're training. It says, it, that's what I said in verse 21. When they had preached the gospel of that city and had taught many. So they're getting people saved and they're teaching them. Right? They're making disciples. They're getting people to, to really get, get on board with, with the Bible, with Jesus Christ. And, and then churches, as a result, are established. Because a church, mind you, is not a building. The building that we're meeting in here now is not a church. We are a church. Just by definition in the Bible, the word church means literally congregation. So when you have a, a people congregated together to worship God, to hear his word taught, this is a church. Now, as these people are getting saved and they're being taught, and look, it, it makes sense. This is why, you know, when we get people saved, we invite them to church because this is the teaching place. 
It's too much work for one person. I mean, you have Paul and Barnabas. Do you think they were going in necessarily and just, just sitting down with each individual person that they get saved and just going to their house and teaching them and teaching them and teaching them? That wouldn't make any sense. They would not be able to reach nearly as many people. They say, no, hey, come here. We'll all gather together and I'll teach. Let's not repeat the same message a hundred times if you get a hundred people saved. Let's all gather together and I could preach the same message to 100 people at once and then teach more and more and more. That's the model. That's why we, you know, that's why we don't just spend tons and tons of time doing the Jehovah's Witness model of just doing all these Bible studies with people inside their home. And, and, then, and if you're doing that, you have to send people out who aren't even ready to teach because you have all these homes to go to or whatever. Look, we're not going to do that model. That's not a biblical model. The biblical model is for us to have a congregation, a church, and do the teaching here. Now, it doesn't mean we won't ever follow up with people and try to get them, you know, motivated and to come in and, and maybe if they need a little help with something here or there, but that's not the model of just, this is the way we teach people. No, people are taught here. So, we see that they preach the gospel, they teach many, churches are established, elders are ordained, they leave. He says, when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. These elders are not being sent out from Jerusalem and from Antioch. They're ordaining elders within the church that they're already establishing. Now, mind you, they're not just showing up. Like Again, we have a kind of a mentality of thinking, hey, we could fly on a plane somewhere, we could drive in a car somewhere, and things happen a lot faster, and you could just seem to do all this stuff and then take off, and it's not a big deal, and the resources are a lot easier. You get, you know, you could, you have someone wiring you money and everything else. That's not the way that things were. Everything happened slower. So they're going from town to town and they're spending significant amount. I mean, they're spending years in places, years in one town to get them established and set up. So that's, that's plenty of time for people to be taught and churches to be established and elders to be ordained. Now, um, in chapter 15, we see that some wolves were crept in to Antioch teaching that circumcision was necessary for salvation. So this becomes a problem now back in Antioch because they, Paul and Barnabas, they went around, they did their circuit, they hit all the areas that the Holy Ghost was leading them to hit, preaching the gospel, establishing churches, and then they came back to Antioch. And now in Antioch, we see that there were people trying to say, oh, no, 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 you know, you also have to be circumcised. And... Um, Paul and Barnabas are sent from the church at Antioch to Jerusalem to bring it up unto the other apostles. Now, the apostle Paul wasn't going to, to ask them, is this right or not right? He knew it, and Barnabas knew, you don't need to be circumcised to be saved. But they're sending him, um, you know, because some of the other church members, they, they had more stock in what, you know, Peter and James and John you know, and these other apostles would say. So they want them to go and talk this out and have a meeting uh, at Jerusalem. So Paul and Barnabas are sent back there. I'm just giving you a little bit of overview here because we're looking at Acts 15, verse 36. Uh, but they're sent back to Antioch with confirmation, basically, that Paul and Barnabas were right. So they go, they have their little meeting, and they talk about it, and they're like, yeah, they don't need to be circumcised. They, you know, we're not going to bring them under the bondage of the law. Paul and Barnabas are right. So they go back and they give them word again that, hey, you know, don't be deceived by these people that are preaching circumcision. Now, um, we're going to see a little bit more info on what they were doing here in Acts 15 when the Holy Ghost sent them out. Look at verse number 36. It says, the Bible says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. So they decide to check up on all the work that they've already done. They, they were still back at Antioch. They preached, they were establishing these churches. At the end of verse 41, it says, you know, and they had a little dispute between each other on who, was, who they wanted to bring, so they kind of split up. And they still went and checked on the churches, and they, they had their own partners to go and check up on them. And then verse 41 says, and he went throughout Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So now they go through and they're just making sure everything's running right, everything's going smooth, with the churches that have already been established. Now, they definitely had established churches. The reason I'm bringing this up, they had to establish churches because they went back to confirm them. So part of the work that they were doing was going out, getting people saved, ordaining elders, and leaving. This is the model that we see. 
in the New Testament more than anything. Show me any other model that's being used than people who are sent forth not to pastor, but just to preach the gospel, establish churches, and then leave. They're not even there anymore. They're gone. It's an independent church. Right now, what we see with it, within our movement is about two different methods, and I already brought them up. The one where a pastor is sent out to, to start a church and to stay at that church and be a pastor of that church, and the other one where a church is formed without having a pastor in place at that specific church, at that location. Okay? And... Both of these methods are churches begetting other churches. Both of them are. Because no matter how you slice it, you've got, you've got a church bringing forth and, and starting up another church, whether it be sending people out like Barnabas and Saul to win souls and then establish a, a, or an elder there. That is a result of the church at Antioch sending them out and, you know, and ultimately the Holy Ghost or God sending them out. But but the church sent them out to start other churches. The churches were started. But had they sent someone else out to start the church and stay at that church, that's not still the church beginning a church, bringing forth after its own kind. Both of them fit that model or that principle that we have of everything bringing forth after its own kind. None of them are, are disagree with that. Now, um, I would actually say, and... and the reason why I'm preaching, one of the reasons why I'm preaching is because I'm sure some people have questions because I had questions the first time I heard about, you know, like Verity Baptist Church in Vancouver being started and Steadfast Baptist Church in Florida being started. And this went against what I had already understood as the way that churches are started. So I started thinking about it and... You know, to be honest with you, I, was, I, I had to do my own study on this. It's, just, it's similar to some other subjects where until you're challenged on it, you know, you don't, you don't really always dig deep into certain areas. It's just kind of accepted. And that's the way people are, no matter who you are. There's a lot of things that you just kind of accept over time. This is the way things have been done. Okay, well, there doesn't, I don't see anything wrong with it. There was nothing blaring about the way that this church was started. To me, I mean, there's nothing, no bells you know, ringing saying, oh man, this scripture, this scripture, you know, you can't do that. You can't ordain a pastor and send him out to, to start a church. Like, that's just totally unbiblical or unscriptural. None of that was, was sound, resounding in my mind about that. If it were, I'd be studying a lot more closely. So when these other churches start up and you say, well, how is that going to work? Who, you know, like, and I think part of the problem people have is they say, well, there's a person there that's teaching and preaching and running the service that's not the pastor. And they immediately will have a problem with that. And I understand that concern or that question, but what do you think was happening when these churches were started when the Apostle Paul was telling Titus and Timothy to ordain elders in churches the churches were already there. They were established. There was not an elder at that location. Yet they were still congregating. Someone had to be teaching. Someone had to be doing instruction. There were people there that, you know, of course, the, the, the original person who came out to preach the gospel and to evangelize and to get things set up was doing the teaching and training. But after a while, even let's say there was no one qualified to pastor there. Well, Paul and Barnabas' job weren't to pastor a church. They were to get them started. And maybe for however long they were there, they were able to teach men. There were people that were able to preach and to lead, but they still weren't quite qualified to pastor yet. They, and they're being called to move on. Well, then they probably moved on. They didn't forget about those churches. They would have to still go back and ordain elders but they were still a church. They were still legitimate. They were still legitimate in God's eyes. There was not a problem with that. Now, the churches are, are I mean, they're kind of, they're like, almost like living entities. I mean, we're people, right? Gathering together. It's not, uh, 
it's not a building. It's not a physical structure. It's not quite as detailed and organized as building a tabernacle is. It's a group of people who have gotten saved and put their faith in Christ that need to congregate and fellowship together because there's a lot of reasons why church is important. And that's a whole other sermon in and of itself, why church is so important and why the need to be together is important and to receive some instruction and get some teaching. But turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 1. I don't see it as being a problem that disciples are teaching and instructing because that's what people are. There's, you know, we don't believe that every believer is a disciple. Right? Every believer is saved. But a disciple is someone who's following God, who's, who's you know, moving in the right direction, who's someone who knows their Bible and, and is able to maybe even teach other people. Okay? The disciple is someone who's closely following. Paul and Barnabas were disciples. Neither one of them was an elder. Neither one of them was married with children. They didn't meet the qualifications to be an elder. Yet they were sent out to start churches. While the churches were being established, we had men. You could say, yeah, but the Apostle Paul, he was still an apostle though, which is kind of a different authority figure than anyone else. Yeah, but what about Barnabas? Because Saul and Barnabas were both called out to do this work by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't just Saul. It was Saul and Barnabas both being called out by the Holy Ghost. Barnabas wasn't an apostle. Barnabas was a disciple, yet he had the calling as well to go out and start these churches and to teach and to train while these churches are being established. So you can have a disciple teaching and training people and running things until there is someone who is qualified to take over the pastorship of that church and then they're cut off. So... Um, and which is exactly what we saw there in, in Acts 14. I didn't really go into detail on this. Acts 14, 23, I'll just read this again for you. We already looked at it. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So at that point, the moment that there is an elder that's ordained, that umbilical cord is cut off. They're commended to God now. He's saying, okay, we, our work here is done. You are no longer really under our authority. You've got a pastor. You're an independent organism. You're an independent church. And now we're commending you to God. That's the model. That's the example. That's the principles that we see being outlined here. So whether you have some, you know, a, a church starting where the umbilical cord is cut immediately because you have a pastor that's qualified, because you have a pastor that's ready to... To, to, to lead and to teach and to be a pastor or whether there's people that need a pastor that need to fellowship together because, hey, they can't go to another church because they're being kicked out of churches because of what they believe, because they believe the Bible. They want to go soul winning. They want to grow. And they're in an area where there's nothing to do there. Well, hey, why don't they gather together? Why don't we have men that we can have there to preach and to teach until the time that there's an or, uh, elder ordained to be pastor of that church and then they're commended to the Lord and then they're going to be their own church. But until that time, you know, a, a, another church is going to help start that and get them going and get them running and get them taught and get them trained, cut the umbilical cord when there's, a, when there's an ordained elder. If anything, it looks to me like method two, the, the other method is a little bit more close to the biblical model than method one. But I don't have a problem with either. I don't think either one is, is in, you know, disregard to the Bible or to Scripture or is, is sinful or is wrong in any way. But if we're just going based off of what we see in Scripture, we see churches being established without elders. And then they get an elder. That's the model that we see. Titus chapter 1, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete. For this cause left I thee in Crete, Titus, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, which means lacking, 
and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So who has the authority here? The Apostle Paul. He's writing to Titus. Titus now is not an apostle. He's a disciple and he's being told to ordain elders in every city. So he's ordaining the elders in churches that already exist. Because it's lacking. There's something lacking there. What's lacking is that you have churches that don't have elders. And Apostle Paul knew this because he'd already been through the area. This is in Ephesus. He's been through all of you know, uh, Ephesus and, and has been teaching and preaching and, and people were getting saved and churches were being started. But he kept on moving and, and building more churches and, you know, and doing more work. But he's not forgetting about the work that's still lacking, the things that still need to be done. And Titus now is helping him because it's a big task. For, you know, it's, it's way too much for one person just to do on their own to start all these churches. And it wasn't, every, well, Paul gets probably the most recognition. But when you read the Bible cover to cover, when you read the New Testament, you see Paul, you know, at the end of the book of Romans, Romans 16, he's saying, you know, say hi to this person. Thanks to Israel. These fellow laborers, these people were wrought with me with the gospel. These, you know, there's so many people that were helping him out along the way. He has Titus, he has Timothy, he has other people that are, that are really helping him do a lot of this, even though much of it gets kind of ascribed to Paul, Paul's work, Paul's ministry. Yeah, but he could never have done it all alone. He had, you know, John and Mark and, and, you know, Barnabas and all these various people with him to help him do the work. So, again, Titus 1, you know, verses 4 and 5 say, hey, you need to ordain elders there. Verse 6, if any be blameless, and then he gives, you know, all these criteria for the elder that he needs to, to, to ordain. If any be blameless, husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. So right there, it's also showing, hey, so they need to be taught these things. This is not some newbie. It's not someone who just got saved. It's someone who's been taught and received the word and, and is, you know, been trained. You know, it goes hand in hand with not being a novice. Verse number 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they have the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now, one of the criticisms I've heard again with method two is that there are people running churches not qualified. Pastor, I already read that. So that's, sorry, I'm just going through my notes here. Um, we've covered that. But we ought to be careful. And one of the reasons I'm preaching is we ought to be careful with our criticisms where good work is being done. Now, when the Sedfast Jacksonville was popping up, I had made an announcement here that we, you know, that we were, gonna dis we were going to support them financially and help that church get off the ground. At the time that we did that, I wasn't exactly sure where I stood with that model of starting churches. It wasn't the way that I would have thought of doing it. And actually, I wasn't sure if it was the right way of starting churches. But you know what I did see? Again, I didn't see anything that was just saying you can't do this from Scripture. Otherwise, we wouldn't have supported them. But I did see a lot of good work being done. I knew that that church being started there, while at the time it wasn't maybe what I thought to be the best way to start a church, because I was still just kind of thinking that there's the best way is just sending out an ordained pastor and that's it. Now I'm not even convinced that that's the best way. It's just a way. It's not bad. I don't think there's anything wrong, either, really, with either one, with either way. But what I saw was a need. I saw people that didn't have a church. We saw people who, who were already, you know, moving to go to a place where they thought there was going to be a church established. There's people who believe right, who want to do a good work, and they've already done, I think they're running over 100 people now, like one of their, their attendance records, 100 people in less than a year, in a very short period of time. Praise God for that. Do you really think that God is cursing them because, oh, you didn't send out an ordained? You've got someone there that's teaching and training and helping that's not an ordained pastor. But you know what? He's not the pastor. And another thing that people need to understand is that there is even more to pastoring than preaching every week. There is more to pastoring than just making sure that, that the soul winning is being done and things like that. There is still even more involved to pastoring a church than that. 
you see things on the outside and you see someone preaching behind a pulpit and you just automatically assume, well, he's just a pastor. He's doing everything a pastor does. No, he's not. At Brother Fannin and, and Seth Bass, he's not doing everything that a pastor does. He's not the pastor of the church. He's a disciple. He's a teacher. Um, pastor Romero is a pastor and he is ultimately responsible and in the authority and is giving directives and is giving charges for other people to get the work done in that area. And when there is somebody that's going to be deemed qualified to be an elder, then an elder is going to be ordained in that, in that church. Same thing in Vancouver, same thing anywhere else where you have these churches. Now, it would be wrong, and here's the concern that people have, and I share this concern as well, but this is just in general, to have these churches, if they're never going to be cut loose, if there's never going to be enough, you know, if they just become these branches and you have this, you know, kind of building a denomination of just having all of these locations being under your control, that is not biblical. But you know what? That is not the intent. And that is not what, the, you know, what at all what these people have set off to do. And I know personally for a fact that that's the case. If that, were, if that was what they were doing, then I would have a problem with that. Just trying to grow and build you know, and funnel all the funds back to the mother church and all this other stuff. No, that's wrong. That is not biblical. But we see in the scripture that it takes, you know, it, it took them a couple years to get churches established, at least a couple years. We, we don't have all the timelines. But it's taken them years in many cases to just get churches established and to have pastors ordained. And these churches are all brand new. They're not running. It's not like they've been around for a decade. And it's like, okay, are they still, are they ever going to be independent or not? You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's not what's happening. They are, they are created. They're being planted. They're being spawned. And for very good reason. Because people need good churches to go to and God's work needs to be done. And the other churches aren't doing it. And if God's work is going to be done, these people need to be able to congregate together and do that work. So, of course, our loyalty lies with the Bible, and we ought to be very careful to make sure our service to God follows the methods that God has outlined in Scripture. Which, again, is one reason why I, I preach this, because I want to make sure that we are looking at Scripture, and this is where we determine what is right and what is wrong. It lies in the Bible. However, when there's areas that are not explicit, I believe God's given us the liberty to make decisions. As in a pastor being ready to pastor and being sent out to, to go around and preach the gospel and teach and train and then just and be the pastor there because you've already been found worthy. I don't have a problem with that. We don't see that happening. But is there anything that would contradict that as, as being just some bad idea and that God's not going to be for that? And God, you know, no. And... The other way, having churches started without really having an elder ready for that church yet. That's actually, we see, we see that happening a lot in the scripture. So I don't see that as being a problem either. Nothing is ever going to be perfect when we're dealing with human people anyways. I mean, we're, we're all sinners and there's going to be some issues one way or another. But um, when the areas are not explicitly laid out, you have to do this. And again, we're just working off of example in the New Testament. It's not even, it's not an explicit statement, this is what you have to do. These are all models. So trying to follow the model is, is the best that we can do. And, you know, just, just to one last point on that topic is just that think about a church service, right? Where in the Bible does it say, you know, because we, we sing two songs, we cover some announcements and some things that are going on in the church. And we do it the same every week, right? Do we not? We, we, we sing a song, we pray, we sing a song, we go through announcements, we, we take a collection, we sing another song, we you know, read the Bible, we pray, preach, sing another song, and fellowship. Now, that's a very explicit order of events that happen in the church, in our church. Do you think I got that? from the Bible of just saying, well, this is how you do it, right? Step, no, of course not. But is it, is it wrong, the way that we do things? Do you think it's wrong to, to sing four songs? Do we have to sing five songs? Should it be six? Should it be two? How long should the sermon be? Should it be for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour? What, I mean, what is it? What's right? Well, if God didn't tell us, he's given us liberty 
Now, should we sing in the congregation unto the Lord, sing praise? Of course we should. That is clear. How many psalms and hymns and spiritual songs should we be singing? It doesn't say. So we've been given liberty. We've been given liberty, liberty in, in, in many aspects of how the church is run. But there are some things that are very detailed. So where there's a lack of detail, we have the liberty. But you know, as, long as, we're, as long as we're following what, what, you know, the biblical model and all the biblical principles, let's not be overly critical of, of, of other people who are serving God and doing good work and are not contradicting Scripture. We all need to be just kind of on board and just have the, the, the right spirit about the law. You know, and people had a problem with that, with uh, you know, breaking the Sabbath. Remember, that they, they, were, they were trying to add more to that commandment than was necessary. They didn't follow the spirit of God's law. They were, just, you know, they were worried about the disciples not washing their hands and you know, picking an ear of corn off while they're doing the work of the Lord on the Sabbath day. And Jesus rebuked them because they didn't understand the spirit of the law and the purpose of the law and what, you know, that they weren't breaking the Sabbath when they were doing God's work, when they were doing what the Lord had for them to do. They weren't working for themselves and pleasing themselves. They were, they were doing what God had told them to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. And when churches are being established and people are going out soul winning, they're doing what God told them to do. So we ought to be all for that. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the, the clear instructions that you do give us, and we pray that you would please help us to have the wisdom to understand the areas that don't have all of the explicit clear answers where we could just point definitely to a specific verse or two and, and know exactly what's right and what's wrong. God, help us to, to gain the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to understand um, what's right and give us the right spirit, dear Lord, that we can be uh, have people in our in our thoughts and prayers and be able to support people for for doing a good work and god i pray that you would please just continue to increase our wisdom and knowledge and help us here lord help us to reach the people in our area with the gospel and to teach and to train them dear lord and that one day we'd be able to to send out other men and that are that are going to be capable of doing more works for you it's in jesus name we pray amen